the 94th Annual Academy Awards. The Oscars returned to the Dolby Theater in Los Angeles after taking a detour to Union Station last year due to the pandemic. The star shined on the red carpet in another return to tradition. And the Oscars ground took a shock of silence after Will Smith smacked Chris Rock on stage after the comedian made a joke about Smith's wife, Jada. Smith cursed at Rock and returned to his seat. Within the last few minutes, Will Smith was announced as winner for Best Actor and King Richard. It's his first ever Academy Award win. All right, great, thank you. And good morning, Mr. Jeffrey Williams. My name is Judge Rashida Oliver. You are here on a bench, uh, a, what we call our bench warrant calendar for Fulton County Superior Court. Uh, be aware that on this calendar, you are here because you have been indicted under 22 SC 182273 for conspiracy to violate the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization Act and participation in criminal street gang activity. Uh, I brought you forward so that you can be put on notice that for the felony charges that you receive, you are to be presented before the judge, uh, Honorable Judge Earl Glanville at the next available calendar that will be presented in courtroom 8F at 9.30 a.m. The date at which uh, you are to appear at this time, I am not aware of. But be aware that you have the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself while you are there and anywhere else. Anything that you say can be used against you. It is my understanding that you are being represented by attorney Ryan Steele and uh, the district attorney's office, Don Geary, are also on. So I wanted to make sure that you were fully aware of that. Um, Eddie A. Geary, is there anything else that you would need to add? And then I will hear from attorney Brian Steele. Judge, um, respectfully, uh, I, I think you've already stated that there's not a bond issue. Um, there's not a really a first appearance other than you're verifying his counsel. Uh, which would handle the, uh, the first appearance issue. One thing I want to put on the record, Judge, and thank you for giving me the opportunity, is uh, at an appropriate time, uh, we're going to file a, an objection or notice of objection to Attorney Steele. Uh, while he's uh, a, a brother attorney, uh, he has represented multiple people on the indictment, and we feel that a conflict would exist and we just want the record clear on that at the appropriate time, we'll move forward with that. Meanwhile in Houston, a jeweler is coming forward with new surveillance video from the night Takeoff died. He tells 11 Alive, Takeoff, Quavo, and their entourage stopped by his store just hours before that shooting. As our Cody Alcorn reports, the man known as the King of Bling was one of the last people to see the Grammy-nominated artist alive. This is surveillance video of Takeoff and Quavo along with their entourage walking into Houston's Johnny Dang and Company Custom Jewelry. We open late for you because that's a convenient that I always take care of them. Johnny Dang says his spot is always a stop for the group. Whenever they go to Houston, you just stop by hanging out and buy some new stuff. He says Takeoff and Quavo stopped by to get some jewelry cleaned and to check out a couple new pieces. He just said right there on Monday night, Takeoff is the one, he very, very quiet, so nice, I've been around with them so many times. Hours later, takeoff was gunned down after leaving a private party in downtown Houston outside a bowling alley. A shock to the entire hip hop industry and fans around the world, including Dang, who was known in the industry as King of Bling. Losing, you know, lost one of the member like takeoff is a very big loss. Houston police say about 40 people were outside that private party when something went down and shots were fired. Police confirmed at least two weapons were fired. Right now, the nation has fallen in love with Casper, the dog who fought off 11 coyotes to save a herd of sheep. But while everyone is hoping for Casper's speedy recovery, not all dogs from this breed are so lucky. So he has he has an open wound on his neck. Um, that has since been closed. He's got a big open wound on his back here that is uh, being treated, and he lost his tail in the attack. I mean, I went out to try to get him back and try to make sure he was okay and um, just eventually couldn't find him. So the next day, we thought we could find him. We thought he must have been killed, um, and so we were looking for him. Um, 
and if he wasn't killed, we wanted we figured he was hurt, and we needed to we we knew he was hurt because we found parts of his tail and blood and other things, um, and so we we were worried about him, um, and we put out a post on Facebook and let let neighbors know because we didn't want we didn't want anybody to run into an injured dog and. Um, and the neighbors came out and helped us look, and we found more coyotes dead, and um, and still didn't find him. And two days later, he showed up here, back here in the pen, um, in the little chicken hutch, and popped his head out, and he looked like a he looked like death. I mean, he was he looked terrible. Um, he came back home again. He came back home, and he he just kind of looked at me like boss. Just stop looking at how bad I look. Just take care of me. Continuing coverage after prosecutors' decision to drop criminal charges against the two Atlanta police officers involved in the 2020 death of Rayshard Brooks. Here's 11 Alive's Joe Hankey with the latest details on how the prosecutor came to his decision. Here we have a peaceful encounter that all of a sudden becomes a violent encounter. And not only does it become a violent encounter, it is quickly changing. Prosecutors Pete Scandalakis and Danny Porter walked through the body camera, cell phone, and surveillance videos. They detailed how officers Garrett Rolfe and Devin Brosnan attempted to arrest Rayshard Brooks for a suspected DUI in June of 2020. After talking with Brooks for more than a half hour, Porter says the situation turned violent. I don't think there's any other way to describe it, but Brooks proceeds to be the crap out of the two officers. During a um, scuffle, Scandalakis says Brooks knocked the officers to the ground. Brosnan's head hits the pavement and he suffers a concussion and Brooks grabs the officer's taser and fires it. He can incapacitate the officers. A taser in the hands of a person who is not trained can also be deadly. Prosecutors said under state law, the taser in Brooks's hands could be considered a deadly weapon, allowing officers to respond with deadly force if it was used against them. Scandalakis says his team broke down the videos frame by frame, including when Brooks began running with Rolf chasing him. Brooks turns back and fires the taser again. Scandalakis says Rolf responded 1.1 seconds later, firing his gun at Brooks three times in half a second, hitting Brooks. Brooks. Viewing the evidence through the eyes of the officers, prosecutors determined they needed to drop the charges. Given the quickly changing circumstances, was it objectively reasonable that he used deadly force? And we conclude it was. In response to yesterday's decision, attorneys for the Brooks family say they are heartbroken and confused, but not angry. They're vowing to continue their fight in civil court despite their criminal case coming to a close. The attorneys say they believe this case should have been heard before a jury. They now say civil court is where they will seek justice as they believe the officer's actions were not justified. While he was on top of them, they didn't know if he was reaching for a gun or whatever. They could have used deadly force, and I would have backed any officer that did it. But they did not. They did not. They chose not to when they were justified. But they decided to use lethal force as a man was running away 19 feet away. To Guidestones in Elbert County, the 19 foot structure mysteriously appeared in 1979, described with 10 guiding principles, leading to countless rumors and conspiracy theories about who built them and why. Don White is live with a closer look at the damage and Don, it looks a lot different right now than it did even when we were looking at this, this location just about an hour ago. Well, that's right, Jennifer. It was about 20 minutes ago we were looking outside of the window and then we saw a backhoe pushing down those structures down there. There were about four of them still standing. And all that remains right now is that mangled pile of rubble. Wow, like really wow. That's the first thing that went through Timothy Rucker's mind seeing this destruction and what people around here have dubbed the American Stonehenge. This, that's historical. Man. Why would you disturb it? That's what the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is trying to figure out. Investigators say unknown individuals detonated an explosive device around four this morning. Our chopper capturing the aftermath. You want to think something like that happened, you know? John Gary said the blast could be heard and felt miles away. I don't know why. Well, that's, that's the shocker of it all. You really don't know why someone would do something like that. I mean, they put yourself in like, a lot of trouble. I was blowing up some rocks. If they'll do something like that, whoever done it will do something different. 
I mean, I hope they catch you ever done it, to be honest with you. Because people like that don't need to be on the street. We have seen videos circulating on social media claiming that this all was caused by a lightning strike. I did reach out to the GBI earlier this afternoon to confirm if that video is authentic, and they just got back to me and told me at this point they cannot confirm if that video is real. Breaking news right now out of Midtown, a manhunt underway for the person who has shot three people. And they want folks to stay out of that area. So the scene unfolding as we speak is near Peachtree Street and 14th Street. Police are asking folks in that area to stay off the roadways, specifically in these areas. Listen up here between 12th Street and Peachtree Street Northeast and 15th Street and West Peachtree Street Northwest. And we know that three people have been shot, uh, Jennifer. We know that that's what we're getting from APD. And the shooter is still on the run. That's right. And this is a live look right now from the Georgia Department of Transportation camera. This is the intersection of Peachtree Street and 14th Street. You can certainly see a very active police presence out there. We have seen some movement. What looks like it maybe with some tactical units and yeah. some cars moving as well. So this is a very active situation. Atlanta police have tweeted information out about this, saying that this is an active situation. And again, Ron, as you mentioned, they are asking people to avoid these areas in Midtown altogether. And so normally when there's a police tactical situation like this, they're trying to canvas the area and pinpoint the last location of the suspect. So that's why they have some of these officers at various corners and they want citizens, other citizens to stay away. If they have an idea of where the shooter is, if they can box that person in and contain them to that area, it makes their job a whole lot easier. And we saw this, Jennifer, on this GDOT camera, what appeared to be, but it has not been confirmed, it looked like a tactical team was coming together, trying to come up with a game plan and then moving up the street. All right, and so here's some new video that we just have coming and it looks like some images from the Midtown area. We do have a crew that is out there on the scene working to gather new details and information. You see, it looks as if other law enforcement entities have responded here as well. In addition to Atlanta police, we saw some vehicles from Georgia Tech and it appears to be Georgia State University police out there as well. And Ron, that's something yeah. that we see frequently when we do have situations like this. You see a Georgia Tech police cruiser yeah. there. You see other entities responding and coming together all together. At Absolutely. Once. So APD is probably calling in mutual aid to try to get other agencies there involved. And Jennifer, this is, as you know, a very fluid situation. I believe that 11 Alive's Joe Hankey is on the scene right now with the very latest. So, Joe, what can you tell us from your perspective where you are and what do you see? We're on right now. We're at 14th and Peachtree here in front of Colony Square. And as you mentioned, very active scene. We're seeing not only Atlanta police out here, but local universities as well as the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Many of those officers right now, many of those officers right now are in tactical gear. And as you see right there, moving around the area. Apologize for the sound, but very active scene. They're moving quickly through the area from time to time, moving their squad cars. They've been investigating quite a few different areas. I want to show you off to the side here. This is the front of Colony Square. Uh, for about a half hour, 45 minutes, officers were heavily focused on Colony Square. There we saw several officers, canine units, officers with long guns, and once again, as I mentioned, in tactical gear. New details tonight after a shooting in Midtown left two men dead and another fighting to survive. Ayesha Kinney is now behind bars, charged with murder, and after Shooting the men, police say she tried to make her escape. Joe Ripley, live for us in Atlanta tonight. And Joe, you have new details on how the suspect made it from the condos to the airport where she was later arrested. Yeah, that's right, Jennifer. Good evening to you tonight. We are hearing from the taxi driver who picked up Aisa Kani in Midtown, made a stop at a home not too far from there in Buckhead, and then eventually took her to the airport where she was later arrested. Uh, he believes this cab driver at that home, she possibly could have shot someone else. I knew something was up. I just didn't know what, what was the problem. Giles Patrick Mandio thought Monday was a normal day. Then the taxi driver picked up Raisa Kani. You can see her from Mandio's in-car camera. She looked like she had, she was some, in some type of fight and something like that, you know. But at the same time, she was trying to, she, 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 she kept calm. 
like always. Mandio says he's picked up Kenny before. This past Monday, though, he says she told him to take her to a home in the Ansley Park neighborhood in Atlanta. No one answered the door, and after five minutes, Mandio says he told Kenny he needed to go to the airport to pick up another passenger. 11 Alive discovered the owner of that home was listed in a lawsuit Kenny filed against people she felt wronged her. Also listed in that lawsuit, two of the three victims police say she shot and killed Monday in Midtown, Michael Shinners and Wesley Freeman. A third man was shot and sent to the hospital. The owner of the home sent us a statement from Finch McCraney saying the law firm represented Kenny for about seven weeks to look into a potential fraud claim she had made against her former company, where Freeman was her boss. Mandio says while Kenny was in his cab Monday, police contacted him. All these phone calls, they're trying to identify the person I have in the car, and then this never happened to me. So did you know anything, or you, are you running from something? She said, no, you, you're safe. Mandia would eventually drop off Kenny and alerted police she was at the airport. He told us he's thankful he's alive to be able to share his story and give the victim's families closure. If she could probably sh shoot me and shoot herself, you know, something like that. So now that I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm very lucky a little bit.